Welcome back, beloved. Today, we are going to be talking about Psalm 22. And I have this question up. Is Psalm 22 talking about Jesus? Uh, this is a very important messianic prophecy written uh, by King David, uh, most likely about a thousand years before Christ was even born. And we know that Jesus is the Word made flesh, and he came to fulfill the Word of God, fulfill Scripture. Um, and so unfortunately, I hate to say it to my Jewish friends, yes, Psalm 22 is clearly talking about Jesus. So I am sorry, both Hebrews and Shebrews, this is just something that we have to accept. Uh, that being said, I'm going to get right into it, and let's break this down verse by verse. So it starts out really clearly. Jesus says, uh, I apologize, this is Psalm 22. This isn't even Jesus speaking yet, right? Or it is through the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, David's words, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Question mark. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season and am not silent. So going back to my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fast forward about a thousand years, Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour of his crucifixion, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? So it starts out really clear there. Uh, moving on, Psalm 22, verses 3 to 5, the psalmist goes on to praise God. He says, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. He goes on to say, and this is where I think it's clearly talking about Jesus, but I am a worm and no man, a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. So I'm despised. People ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, and this is really important. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Right? So they're basically saying, you love the Lord, you trust in the Lord, let him deliver you. Well, Matthew 27, 39, it says, everyone who passed by while he was being crucified blasphemed him, wagging their heads. Right, So they're hurling insults, they're blaspheming him. But then this is what they say in verse 43, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. It's the same as in Psalms. It's he trusted in God, the Lord delights in him, right? Let's see if he'll deliver him, right? Going back to Psalm 22, we're going to fast forward to verse 12. Uh, it, the psalmist says, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Whenever we're talking about bulls of Bashan, it usually has a negative connotation in Scripture. These are talking about people here. So many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. So this is like ravenous beasts surrounding him here. And let's look at what Matthew records about Jesus. I believe this is what he's talking about. It says the soldiers of the governor, this is before he was crucified, they took Jesus into the praetorium. They gathered the whole garrison around him, dozens of men. Imagine this. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted the crown of thorns. They put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They're mocking him. They bowed the knee him. Uh, I'm sorry. They bowed the knee before him and they mocked him. They, they casting jokes at him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. So read those words again after knowing that. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls have, of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Imagine a bunch of just, you know, rowdy soldiers all around. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know he's the son of God. They do not know that he is God in human flesh. And they do not know that he is dying for their sins, possibly, if they turn to him. Um, but I believe some of the Romans did turn to him, which is just 
So beautiful. Um, Psalm 22, 14 then says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Now remember the path, remember Jacob, his hip was out of joint, the Passover lamb, none of the bones could be broken from the Passover lamb. But I'm poured out like water. That's really important. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Look at John chapter 19. It says the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first prisoner and then the other one who was crucified with Jesus, right? But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Remember Psalm twenty-two, fourteen: 14, I'm poured out like water. His heart was like wax. It melted within him. Uh, John then goes on to write, He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced, right? We pierced Jesus. The Jews, Romans, everybody's going to look on him. Revelation 1, 7, he's coming on the clouds and everyone will see him, even they who pierced him. So that's so important. Psalm 22, 15 and 16, we're going to go on. It says, my strength is dried up like a pot sherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, right? Just picturing somebody thirsty and their tongue is just dried up in their mouth. They're, they're at the dust of death, right? For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I'm not even going to go into they pierced my hands and my feet. We all know that's Jesus. There's other Hebrew interpretations that says like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. If you want to get, you know, really technical there, but either way, his hands and his feet, we know they were pierced, right? Whether they were pierced like a lion, you know, tearing them apart or pierced by nails doesn't really matter here. Um, but I want to talk about the specificity of Bible prophecy, the, the hundreds of prophecies about Jesus and everything down to just the smallest ridiculous detail. So I want you to pay very close attention. It's my strength's dried up, right? That's important, but this is more important. My tongue clings to my jaws. He's thirsty. He's incredibly thirsty. You've brought me to the dust of death. Look at John 19, 28. It says, after this, this is while he's being crucified, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. You understand that? It's saying, so that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus literally said, I thirst. What scripture is he fulfilling? I think it's very clearly Psalm 22. There's another Psalm, I believe it's 69, where it literally says, they've offered me vinegar and gall to drink. And that's exactly what they offered Jesus like a thousand years later. It, it's incredible. Uh, Psalm 22, verses 17 and 18 now, it says, I can count all my bones. Not a bone of Jesus was broken because Jesus was our Passover lamb, okay? The Passover lamb, when that was instituted, none of its bones could be broken. So it's, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They, and this is so specific, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Every single gospel pretty much records that story, right? They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. I mean, that's incredible. He's saying, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They had no idea they're fulfilling scripture. Uh, you know, God gave them over to where they couldn't see it. However, God sovereignly ordained this. But they were literally, there was a true, literal person that actually divided the garments of our Lord Jesus Christ and cast lots. And they had no idea what they were doing. Uh, going on, Psalm 22, verse 19 to 22, uh, the psalmist then says, You, O Lord, do not be far from me, O my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Okay, that sounds a lot like death. He's saying, save me, deliver me, don't be far from me, right? Deliver, it says right here, my precious life. That's what he's praying to be delivered. And then look at this. 
you have answered me. I believe that's clearly foreshadowing the resurrection. He's praying for his precious life. We know Jesus Christ was resurrected, right? I, and then it says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Uh, Paul, you know, a thousand years later, Paul wrote in Hebrews 2 verse 12, uh, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So I'm not making this up. <laughs> Psalm 22 going on, verses 23 and 24. Then it says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. Why are we glorifying him? Why are we fearing him? Why are we praising him? Because he raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Remember, Jesus is fully God. He's also fully man. And he cried out to God both on the cross before the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, throughout his whole life, and God has risen him from the dead. Uh, Psalm 22 now, verses 25 to 27, it says, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Remember, the poor are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. That sounds like the gospel, right? The psalmist is praying for his life. It's granted. He begins to praise the Lord. So does Jacob and the descendants. Now all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. This is the gospel going to the nations. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. He then goes on to say, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over all the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust, all those who die, right, shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. Though uh, Jesus Christ, he is Lord of heaven, he is Lord of earth, and like it or not, he's even the Lord of hell. It, everyone, every single human being in all of creation, in all of time, Everyone will bow the knee before him, regardless of where they end up for eternity. We will all bow to Jesus. He then goes on to say, verse 30, a posterity, a seed shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare, and this is so important, his righteousness, his righteousness, the Lord's righteousness to a people who will be born, right? The next generation, who will be born, that he has done this. I'm fulfilling that. Every time you preach the gospel, you are fulfilling that. <laughs> you are the posterity serving the Lord, recounting of the Lord to the next generation. You're coming, you're declaring his righteousness to a people that will be born, that he has done this, that he has risen from the dead. Uh, Isaiah 53 10 draws on this. It says he's talking about the suffering servant that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why would it please the Lord to bruise anybody, right? He's put him to grief when you make his, Jesus Christ's soul, an offering for sin. That's why Jesus Christ died. He died for his sin, our sins. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's so important to get the gospel correctly. The reason it pleased the Lord to bruise him, the Romans killing Christ, that doesn't do anything about our sin. Jesus Christ took the wrath of Almighty God for us, a wrath, a justice for our sins that we wouldn't be able to pay in all eternity. He took that for us. So just to finish up here, I've got a few verses where I want to explain uh, God's righteousness. And I have highlighted, this is an impossible task. Imagine trying to explain the righteousness of God. Every good preacher must just get overwhelmed trying to do this. It's impossible. But I've got a few great verses for it. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. It's talking about the Messiah, right? The root, he came from the line of David. So that branch of righteousness, a king, Jesus, shall reign and prosper. 
and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. That's when he comes back. Now, this is his name by which he will be called. This is so important. The Lord, our righteousness. That's the name of Jesus. He displays the righteousness of God. The Lord, our righteousness. His sacrifice on the cross, that was the atonement for our sins. But his perfect life, the fact that he lived life perfectly, he never sinned. Every good deed he did, all of that is fulfilling. When he was baptized, he said, I did this to fulfill all righteousness. He literally kept the law for us. When we come to him, when we repent of our sins and we believe in him, we get his righteousness. That's incredible. Romans 1, 16 to 17 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of the good news of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So check this out. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Do you see that? Those three words are so important. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. There's no wiggle room in there. It's Faith to faith. There's not like faith to some works and then faith or faith to faith and a little works or works and then no, it's from faith to faith. There is no wiggle room. God, uh, I'm sorry, Christ, who is God, died for the ungodly. And when he saves you, you repent and you believe in Jesus, that is the sole reason on judgment day that you will have any righteousness. None of our righteousness is from ourself. It is from faith to faith. And that's the gospel. It's God who saves us. He just, you, he, the gospel is his tool. It's the power of God to salvation. So from faith to faith, so important. And one final verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's a mystery we can all ponder on, but somehow through what Jesus did, we become the righteousness of God. He gets all our sin. We get all his righteousness. That is absolutely amazing. And as good as all these things are, as much as we can rejoice in them, you need to make sure, like Paul said, examine yourself. Make sure of your calling and your election, right? Because if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are claiming that the Holy Spirit has washed you, given you a new heart and new desires. And you will know if you are in Christ and you need to be searching for that assurance of salvation. And I believe you clearly do it through scripture. Go look at how much the entire Bible, look at Psalm 22 written a thousand years before Christ was even born. The entire Bible points to Jesus Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't turn to the right or to the left. He is all we need. Have a great day.